So, did you ever hear about the time that Iceland and the UK went to war three times over a bunch of fish, and then Iceland won all three times? Yeah, I didn't think so. Between the late 1940s and 1976, the two island nations of Iceland and the UK all but declared war, despite the fact that there were no casualties, and the former had no army and just a minimal coast guard. In the waters between these two nations, three confrontations took place between Great Britain, one of the world's greatest powers, and Iceland, a small island of just a hundred thousand people, and each time, Iceland won that conflict. Perhaps unsurprisingly, a nation surrounded by a hundred square miles of ocean on all sides relies heavily on fishing. It had long been island's main food supply and primary export, but of all of the fish, cod was the most important, as it was much like a source of national pride, and even today Iceland takes its fishing very seriously. It is Iceland's very own watery white gold, and the country carefully guards its bounty. But in the lead-up to the Second World War, Icelandic fishermen grew concerned about the amount of British ships in their waters, which affected how much cod that they could catch themselves. Anxiety would mount until in 1952 they announced new rules. This would limit the Icelandic waters where British fishermen could trawl, and it expanded Icelandic fishery zones from three to four nautical miles from their own shores. The United Kingdom retaliated by imposing a ban on Icelandic fish in British ports. It was a costly sanction to the small nation, as the UK was Iceland's largest export market. It did backfire though, when the USSR took up the export for the Icelandic fish, and in the midst of the Cold War, the US followed suit, fearing greater Soviet influence in the vitally located state, and the US would encourage its European allies to do the same. The sanctions from the UK minimized, and Iceland could maintain their new limits. Eventually, in 1956, Britain capitulated in the First Cod War, in the wake of a decision from the Organization of European Economic Cooperation that sided with Iceland. That might have been that, but in September of 1958, Iceland expanded its national waters still further, from 4 nautical miles to 12 deep into waters that had previously belonged to no one. NATO, the Western Military Alliance, was up in arms, and Britain refused to cooperate. With the backing of virtually every Western European country, Britain insisted that they would continue to fish where they had before, under the protection of Royal Navy warships if necessary. An altercation occurred in November of 1958, when an Icelandic gunboat fired warning shots at a British trawler. Eventually, a British naval ship, the HMS Russell, intervened, and they pointed out that the gunboat was still outside the four-mile limit that the British recognized, and they were thus in international waters. The Icelandic captain refused to leave, and he ordered his men to man their guns and approach the trawler, with the intent to capture or sink the vessel. Russell, a comparable titan, made it clear that they would sink the boat if they shot the trawler. A brief stalemate would follow, but upon the arrival of more British ships, the Icelandic captain backed down. By early 1961, clashes such as these made the situation more and more unattainable. Diplomatic relations were worsening, and the chaperones for the British fishing vessels were getting expensive. With Icelandic threatening to leave NATO, a compromise was drawn up. The UK would recognize the 12-mile water limit, with certain concessions in the first three years for British fishermen. A new rule was also imposed that any further fights over cod between the two countries were to be sent directly to the International Court of Justice. It was a prudent decision, but one that had little effect. Barely a decade later, in September of 1972, the Icelandic government extended its fishing limits again, now to 50 miles. In the past, they'd been reluctant to assert themselves with military force. Now, however, all of Iceland's Coast Guard ships were armed with trawl wire cutters, meaning that the fisherman would not only lose its catch, but also an item valued at over $5,000. Once again, Western Europe opposed, and once again, Iceland held firm, declaring that they were battling against imperialism and further economic independence. 
trawlers and Coast Guard vessels were ramming into each other in attempts to prevent the cable cutting. Britain's NATO commitments made them unable, legally, to call on the Navy for support. Vessels were damaged, but surprisingly no one was ever hurt under any of these altercations. Under pressure from NATO, Britain once again capitulated in late 1973, and Iceland's determination had carried it to victory yet again. That might have been that, but legal changes on the global scale in 1975 would provoke Iceland to act again. Despite the 50 mile limit, Icelandic fish stocks were under threat from overfishing, so a 200 mile limit was considered and then adopted. British trawlers and fishermen within that limit began clashing with Icelandic gunboats, and the Royal Navy was brought in once again. It was short but messy, with 35 ramming incidents occurring in six months. Iceland refused to negotiate, and eventually they would suffer diplomatic ties with Britain altogether, despite repeated meetings between government officials. Once again, NATO stepped in, and Iceland was threatening to leave for good, and these naval clashes risked getting out of hand. For the third and final time, Iceland would assert itself, and the United Kingdom would cave. The Cod Wars were over, and while this is normally labeled as a bloodless war, there were two casualties, a British fisherman who had been hit by a towing cable, and an Icelandic engineer who was accidentally electrocuted while repairing his hull. The British economy may have not relied on cod as much as Iceland's, but the effects were certainly felt. As Britain's fisheries effectively closed, a depression settled over the country's large northern fishing ports, one such as Hull and Fleetwood. Thousands of skilled fishermen and those in related trades would lose their jobs, and Iceland's 200-mile zone became the standard, curtailing foreign fishing all over the world. All of this barely slowed the overfishing of cod, though. In 1998, the World and Wildlife Foundation placed cod on the endangered species list, enacting limits on how much cod people could catch, no matter where in the world that they were located. Iceland might have prevented foreign powers from fishing in its waters, but even a tiny country with a fine spirit was no match for the natural and international limits now placed on its own national treasure.